Hi, my name is Susan Barrett. I'm an attorney in Santa Rosa, California. I'm Roger Rombro. I'm an attorney in Los Angeles County. And Susan and I are going to discuss what are referred to as the preliminary declarations of disclosure. These are forms that are required by the Judicial Council. So they are necessary for everyone to have in order to obtain a judgment of dissolution of marriage. So Susan, let me ask you a few questions if I may. Sure. The preliminary declaration of disclosure consists of several forms, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, what would be the first form if you can share with that with us? There's a declaration of disclosure, which is basically a cover page that references some of the other forms that are part of this declaration of disclosure packet. There's also an income and expense declaration there's a schedule of assets and debts. Parties can also use property declarations for that purpose. And then parties will sign a declaration confirming to the court that they have exchanged these declarations of disclosure with each other. Okay. What is the purpose, if you can tell us, uh, why the uh, legislature and the Judicial Council would require that people have these forms, fill them out, and, and uh, serve them on each other? Well, parties in a divorce case might sometimes be motivated to conceal assets from each other, and the court wants to ensure that each party signs a declaration under penalty of perjury, stating that they have disclosed all relevant information concerning all assets, debts, income, and expenses, in that person's name, the spouse's name, or joint names, in order so that the court can know that when it signs a judgment or enters a judgment, that it's making a fair uh, allocation of the finances between the parties, and also so that parties who are entering into a settlement can be assured that they are fully informed as they're negotiating whatever their settlement might be. There's a phrase that appears on the Declaration of Disclosure, the original, the initial form, uh, which is material facts and information. Can, can you tell us what that means? Sure, that would be essentially anything that you might think is relevant to making a decision about any financial issue in your divorce case. It might be something like an appraisal, it might be the fact that one party has an interest in a pension, um, it might be um, information about a business that's operated by one party, as well as the values of those things and all of the um, parties are essentially required to provide pretty extensive documentation so that each of them is fully informed concerning their assets and debts. On the form, there's uh, at the very bottom, there's a place for a signature and just above the signature, there's a phrase I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California that the foregoing is true and correct. Can you tell us why that is on the form? Sure, so parties are required to sign it under penalty of perjury so that the parties can be confident that it's a complete disclosure. All right, at the bottom of the page, just above the signature block, on the first page of the disclosure statement. There are three boxes. One says that the person is affirming that they have disclosed all assets. One says that they're disclosing all obligations. But there's a third one about disclosing all investment opportunities. What is that about? It might be an opportunity to purchase a property. It might be an opportunity to invest in a business, but it's something that could produce income for one or both of the parties, so it's important to disclose that. The form requires disclosure. It says preliminary. There are two boxes on the form. One is for preliminary and one's for final. At what point in time, if you can share with us, would a person no longer have an obligation to disclose to the other party? Parties have a duty to uh, augment their or supplement their preliminary declarations of disclosure until the judgment's entered. They have an ongoing duty to disclose all of the same stuff that is called for in all of those forms. 
after the judgment is entered, parties still have continuing duties until an asset is actually divided or a financial obligation is satisfied. Let me talk to you a little bit about the schedule of assets and debts. That's one of the forms that has to be attached to the disclosure statement. Isn't that correct? Correct. All right. Now, on the schedule of assets and debts, there are multiple columns and there are multiple pages. Is that right? That's correct. Can you share with us some of the items that would be included in the schedule of assets and debts that a person who would have to disclose to the other? Just about anything that you can think of that might have a value, whether it's positive or negative. So this form is going to be used to disclose real property. It's going to be used to disclose personal property to some extent, bank accounts, cars, retirement accounts, other investment accounts, and every kind of debt that you can think of. Is there any place on the form for a person to identify an asset or a debt that they consider to be their own? On the schedule of assets and debts, there is a column next to the asset uh, information column that indicates whether something's separate property. Uh, so you can indicate in that column. You And again, you want to include both your own separate property and the other spouse's separate property to the extent you have information about it. What about values? You would list estimated values if that's the best you can do. If you've got something that has a statement associated with it that documents a value, uh, you would list that value. I find it helpful also to list the date on that statement as a reference. Let me go back to that phrase that I asked you about at the very beginning, the, the phrase material facts and information. How, if, if at all, would that relate to uh, completing a schedule of assets and debts? This is how you disclose, for the most part, you, all of the material information about assets and debts. So this form calls for you to identify every asset you can think of. There's a catch-all category for other assets, so if an asset doesn't fall into another category, you'd list it there. The form also calls for you to attach statements for each of the assets or debts. For some kinds of assets and debts, that's the material information. If you have other information that somehow wasn't captured on the schedule of assets and debts form or the, the statements you attached, you can provide a narrative statement on that cover page. When you're talking about valuations, um, w what value would you put down on the form? You would put the current value on the form. Um, and again, for something that has a statement associated, you provide the statement that confirms that value. If you're providing your estimate of the value, for example, if it's real property, you can explain how you arrived at your estimate or just sort of indicate it's an estimate. And what about uh, valuing such things as uh, household furniture and furnishings? Is that replacement value? If you have to go out and buy something, what would you do with that? These are generally valued at garage sale or yard sale value. Uh, so for most people, it's not a real cost-effective way to spend your time itemizing household items on this particular form. There's a separate item, item three on the form, that calls for art, antiques, jewelry, where you might list more valuable items. The household furnishings item can often be, you can just list sort of miscellaneous household furniture. Let's talk about the other form that we haven't mentioned previously, but it's required on the Declaration of Disclosure. That's the Income and Expense Declaration. Can you tell us the purpose of that form and uh, what information, if anyone, would use to fill it out? So this form is where you would provide information about earning capacity, your actual income, your estimate of the other person's income. You provide pretty detailed and comprehensive information about your income from every different source that it might come from. You are also going to disclose your average monthly expenses in fairly broad categories. And then if child support is relevant in your case, you have provide some information about that. In terms of income, what if uh, someone has their own business? How would they uh, document that income? It's approximately in the middle of the second page on the income and expense declaration. The form calls for self-employment income and other kinds of income like trust or um, rental income. 
A person would document that income since they don't have a pay stub necessarily as a self-employed person by attaching a profit and loss statement or it can even be a federal Schedule C type form. The third page of the Income and Expense Declaration addresses expenses. Whose expenses uh, would one report there? You list the expenses for everybody in your household. At the top of the form, you will list everybody who lives in the household and their relationship to you, their income if they have income, and whether they contribute to paying the household expenses. Does one have to go and uh, particularize what their expenses are? Do they have to go through their receipts, t total them all up for a given period of time in order to give an accurate statement of their expenses? Or can they average them out or give some kind of an estimate? The expense page of the form has check boxes under the list of family members that where you can indicate actual expenses, estimated expenses, or proposed needs. For the declaration of disclosure purpose, most people can complete the form using estimated expenses. You might still want to go through some records to get a sense of what average expenses might be. And you want to include things that only come up infrequently, like a new roof on a house or new tires on a car. It can be helpful to look back through records to just get a sense of how frequently they come up and what the cost is. Let me conclude with some questions regarding the last page of the Income and Expense Declaration, which addresses child expenses. Can you share with us whether or not there are any requirements where one can disclose what it costs to uh, be able to work, so child care expenses, would, those, would that be something that you would put down? That's something that you disclose on page four of the form, your uh, child care expenses, and it's something the court requires that information because it's something that would be split if child support was at issue. And my final question is, is there some way that a party could disclose or identify expenses for a special needs child? And what would be the purpose for that? That would also be included on page four of the income and expense declaration form. The reason why is that is where you are giving information to the court or the other party, specifically why you would have additional costs that would justify child support above guideline. Overall, what would, what would be the purpose, what's the significance of these declarations of disclosure for the benefit not only of each spouse but for the court? It's a way for the court to ensure that both parties have shared all of the information that they're aware of concerning any asset, debt, or income and expense that any party might have an interest in so that the court, when those issues come before the court, has all of the relevant information before it and again, so that parties in negotiating their settlement agreements know that they are fully informed concerning the complete extent of the community estate. So let me ask you this. What is the downside for someone in the event that they may either intentionally or unintentionally fail to identify either an asset or a debt? That person could be, that would be considered to be an omitted asset. That person would potentially be at risk of having not just the community portion of that asset, but the entire asset awarded to the other spouse and also be subject to pretty significant sanctions uh, by the court. And doesn't the court then retain jurisdiction the, that it would be the power to address any omitted asset or debt? Exactly right. So the court in that case would have, it would retain jurisdiction over that omitted asset that wasn't included in your judgment so that it could still be allocated to one party or the other. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.